Welcome to the Introduction to Service Management Terminology module. By the end of this module, you'll be able to recall and describe the definition of key service management terms and concepts. ITIL has been around a long time, over 30 years in fact. The first ITIL material began to appear as a series of topic-specific booklets towards the end of the 1980s. Early topics included service level management, incident management and problem management. The reputation of IT generally at that time was not great. At a time when IT budgets were increasing rapidly, there was a popular perception that IT was becoming something of a financial black hole. The industry press regularly featured stories and reports of IT projects which had overrun, overspent and underdelivered, resulting in services that did not fully deliver the expected value. There was a general feeling that the IT industry needed to become more professional. The British government was also becoming concerned that it was not getting value from its investments in IT, so it commissioned the Central Computing and Telecommunications Agency, CCTA, a government agency, to develop a set of best practice guidance backed by a professional qualification for the effective and efficient provision of IT services. The result was version 1 of the Information Technology Infrastructure Library, or ITIL, an integrated framework of service management best practice processes. Historically, IT organisations were often focused on software, hardware and other technology, rather than focusing, or being driven by, customer requirements. ITIL promoted the concept, that is, that IT service providers needed to become more professional and systematic in developing relationships with their customers, which would enable them to focus on understanding and fulfilling their customer needs. It seems strange now to think that for many organisations at that time, the idea that IT should treat its users like customers was a new way of thinking. Although new, it quickly caught on. ITIL rapidly established itself across the world as the international standard for service management best practice. And, although ITIL originated in the IT sector, its message is universal to all service provider organisations. Organisations exist to provide product or service to customers. The organisations which are most likely to succeed over the longer term are those that develop a culture and set of capabilities that puts their customers' current and ever-changing needs at the heart of everything they do. What is service management? The ITIL definition of service management, as shown on the screen, states that it is a set of specialised organisational capabilities for enabling value for customers in the form of services. That's a lot of detail to take in, so let's break it down. Firstly, let's think about the term Organisation. ITIL defines an organisation as a person or group of people that has its own functions with responsibilities, authorities and relationships to achieve its objectives. What someone might find surprising about this definition is the idea that an organisation might be a single person. However, for many service providers, this is one of the challenges they face. Their customers include millions of individuals around the world accessing their services across the internet. Establishing a service relationship with millions of individuals so that you can understand and respond to their ever-changing needs is an interesting challenge. A capability is the ability to carry out an activity. Individuals have capabilities based, for example, on their personal skills, knowledge and experience. But an organisation also develops capabilities based on, for example, the quality and maturity of the organisation's processes, the sophistication and degree of integration of the toolset that the organisation uses to build and deliver services, and the organisational structures, roles and responsibilities which allow the organisation to make the best use of the capabilities of their staff. ITIL provides guidance to help an organisation increase its capability to consistently and successfully execute the many activities that need to take place along the journey from identification of a new service requirement to the successful introduction of that service to live running and beyond. Activities may be carried out by individuals or teams using their skills, knowledge and experience 
following defined processes, but they may also be automated and executed using a combination of software and hardware technology. Value Defined as the perceived benefits, usefulness and importance of something, value is a concept that we will explore in more detail shortly and come back to throughout this course. At this point, let's just notice two things about this definition. Firstly, value is subjective. It is based on perception. One of the core service management capabilities a service provider will have to develop is the ability to understand how their customers perceive value and the factors that influence that perception. The second interesting thing is that value is not defined in purely financial terms. Many services deliver value without offering financial gain. And finally, a service is described as a means of enabling value co-creation by facilitating outcomes that customers want to achieve, without the customer having to manage specific costs and risks. This is a term we will explore in more detail on the next slide. The definition of a service is shown again on the screen. A service is a means of enabling value co-creation by facilitating outcomes that customers want to achieve without the customer having to manage specific costs and risks. So, a service involves at least two organisations in a cooperative service relationship, a service provider and a service consumer. Both parties have a role to play in the co-creation of value, and we will explore this service relationship in more detail in the next module. The service itself is not the source of the value. It is the means of enabling value by facilitating the outcomes a customer wants to achieve. In other words, a customer has reasons for choosing to use a service. These reasons are the outcomes the customer wants to achieve, and they can be many and varied. For example, increased revenue, regulatory compliance, better support for the environment. Use of the service increases the likelihood that the customer will achieve these outcomes. Think about the terms outcome and output. These two words sound similar and, in ITIL, are related, so it would be easy to mix them up. However, as both terms are explicitly included in the exam syllabus amongst a list of concepts you should be able to describe, it is important to be clear on their meaning. An outcome is a result that a customer wants to achieve. It is the desire to achieve outcomes that leads to a consumer to consider different services. Outputs are the tangible and intangible deliverables of an activity. Within the context of a service, the service outputs enable the achievement of the desired outcomes. As mentioned on the previous slide, the desired outcomes could be many and varied. While there are many things that can influence a customer's perception of service value, it is probably safe to say that it is unlikely that a customer would feel that they were getting value from a service which was not consistently enabling them to achieve their outcomes. To ensure a service provides value, therefore, the service provider must seek to understand or anticipate the outcomes that the customer is seeking and ensure a focus on these is maintained throughout the design, build and ongoing delivery of the service. This, usually, is easier said than done. Historically, service providers have tended to focus on the outputs of a service, particularly the tangible deliverables. It is easy to understand why. These are easier to identify and measure. Moreover, as they are direct outputs of a service, they are within the control of the service provider. Service metrics based on outputs, such as availability of systems and information, system throughput and response times, are useful measures of service quality, but they do not necessarily reflect the impact that these have on the achievement of customer outcomes. This has resulted in many an uncomfortable service review where, for example, the service provider is delighted to report the good news that the monthly service availability target of 99.5% has been achieved, only to find that the customer is very unhappy 
because the 0.5% outage happened at the worst possible moment and had a significant business impact. Outputs are important to the customer, but only in so far as they enable the outcomes. Depending on the relationship between the provider and the consumer, it can be difficult for the provider to fully understand the outcomes that the consumer wants to achieve. The consumers themselves may need assistance to articulate their desired outcomes clearly in terms that the service provider can understand and respond to. The service provider may even influence consumer thinking in this respect by making the customer aware, for example, of the possibilities that new technologies or approaches open up. A simple example may serve to illustrate the difference between outcomes and outputs. A company provides a language learning service through a software application that customers can download via the internet. The company's sales message is that users of their application will be able to learn a foreign language to a conversational degree of proficiency within six months in a fun and engaging way, and with only 10 minutes per day study. These messages are targeted to the desired outcomes of their potential customers. To be able to speak a foreign language in a reasonably short timescale, without too much effort or stress. The application itself, the course of lessons, a supplementary stream of podcasts and other materials which can be downloaded to a mobile device, are all outputs of this service which have been designed to help the student achieve the desired outcome of language proficiency. Achieving desired outcomes requires resources, and therefore costs, and is often associated with risks. Service providers help their consumers to achieve outcomes and, in doing so, take on some of these costs and risks. This is what is meant by the second part of the definition of a service, that service facilitates outcomes without the customer having to manage specific costs and risks. But the use of a service is rarely cost or risk-free. In addition to service charges, for example, a consumer may have to spend time and effort, and therefore cost, in managing the relationship with the provider. While the service provider can take on many of the risks associated with achievement of the outcomes, there will always be some risks introduced. For example, the risk that the relationship with the service provider is not successful. The definition of risk is shown on the screen now. The more certain the outcomes are, the smaller the degree of risk is. Notice also that positive as well as negative effects may emerge from uncertainty. So it is clear that the use of a service may introduce costs and risks, while removing other costs and risks. What might be less obvious, perhaps, is the possibility that while services, by design, facilitate certain consumer outcomes, they may also, by design or accident, have a negative impact on other outcomes. For example, a web application is updated to include additional security around login to protect the personal data of its clients. This is a positive benefit for its customers. However, logging onto the app is now more complicated and time-consuming. This is a negative outcome. Ultimately, it is the consumer who will decide whether the total positive benefits outweigh the negative disbenefits so that value is achieved. To finish this session, let's consider two factors which are essential to a service's ability to facilitate the outcomes the customer wishes to achieve and therefore help create value. Utility and warranty. Utility, which means fitness for purpose or what the service does, is described as the functionality offered by a product or service to meet a particular need. To have utility, a service must either support the consumer and or remove constraints from the consumer. Many services do both. Warranty, fitness for use or how the service performs, is defined as the assurance that a product or service will meet agreed requirements. Warranty often relates to service levels, addressing areas such as service availability, capacity, security and continuity. The language learning app we described in an earlier example can usefully illustrate these concepts. A customer signed up and downloaded the app, 
and was delighted with its utility features, including the course of structured lessons and the supporting podcast series. She felt the application was well designed to support her in her desire to learn a new language. The customer also particularly appreciated the utility of being able to download lessons and store them for later playback, removing the constraint of having to be connected to a network in order to study. However, she was less impressed with the warranty of the application. The application frequently froze in the middle of a lesson. Sometimes the customer would have to quit the application and restart the lesson from the beginning. This was becoming frustrating. So when she also heard that the company had had a security breach and some customer data had been compromised, it was the final straw. She decided enough was enough and terminated her membership. A service must have appropriate levels of both utility and warranty if it is to deliver value. One without the other will not do. Well done, you've completed this module. Now try the following exercises to check your recall and understanding.